Um, hi, uh, I would like to welcome you to 2022's Mehboobul Haq Distinguished Lecture Series on the 108th session of LUMS Live that the Mehboobul Haq Center at LUMS is co-hosting with the Institute of Economic and Development Alternative, the Center of Economic Research in Pakistan, the Institute of Development Studies at Sussex, and the Consortium of Development Policy Research. Uh, I'm Ali Chima. I'll be moderating today's session with my colleague, Dr. Farah Said who's an assistant professor of economics at LUMS and the associate director of MHRC. We're extremely excited to host uh, this distinguished lecture by Professor Esther Duflo on social experiments to fight poverty from research to policy. Professor Duflo needs no introduction. She was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2019. She won the award for introducing a new approach, uh, field experiments to find empirically reliable answers about the best ways to combat poverty in the developing world. She is the Abdul Latif Jamil Professor of Poverty Alleviation and Development Economics in the Department of Economics at MIT and co-founder of uh, the Poverty Action Lab at JPAL. She founded JPAL to ensure that policy on a range of developing country challenges, including poverty, is informed by scientific evidence using randomized controlled trials of actual interventions. Uh, the aim is to increase the impact of policies to use to fight these challenges. In her research, she seeks to understand the economic lives of the poor with an aim to help design and evaluate social policies. She's co-authored Poor Economics, uh, a radical rethinking of the way to fight global poverty. Uh, with Professor Abhijit Banerjee. This book won the Financial Times and Goldman Sachs Business Book of the Year Award in 2011. Uh, and their recent book, which is really worth reading, is Good Economics for Hard Times. So what are effective ways to fight poverty in countries like Pakistan? Should poverty reduction be left to growth trickle down? Or do we need uh, interventionist policy, policy, uh, poverty reduction program? Um, and what should the what does an effective menu look like? Policymakers often struggle with these questions. We have an opportunity to learn uh, from Esther about the what the global evidence suggests are effective policies in the fight against poverty. And importantly, we'll also learn about how we can structure and use research to inform effective policy making. We'll keep to our standard format with Esther giving a lecture for 40 to 45 minutes, which will be followed by Q&A, moderated by Farah and me. Um, and please post your questions through the chat function of Facebook uh, and the LUMS Live team will uh, pick up your questions and share them with us, which we'll bring into the discussion. And with that, uh, Esther, let me hand it over to you. Hi everyone, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me. Um, I am indeed going to talk uh, today about social experiment to, to fight poverty. The broader context of whether uh, growth is sufficient and trickle down will naturally follow and what you can add is something that actually we address uh, in about at least two chapters of this recent book, Good Economics for Hard Times. Um, so I would be very happy to address it in the question and answer question, but for, for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to focus on, the, on, on, on assuming that you want to go a little bit beyond macroeconomic policy and encouraging growth. And share with you our experience oops, at uh, JPAL and my personal experience in uh, using research and in particular social experiment the most effective way, the mo most effectively to, uh, to affect policies and what are the, the, the challenges and uh, uh, what are the lessons we've learned so far to become as effective as possible. So that's the, the plan for today. Um, so at MIT, uh, where I teach very close to my department, there is this board, uh, Calculus versus Real People. And uh, sometimes, you know, is it really a choice we have? Is it that either we do science or we try to affect poverty? That's kind of, that's not the idea that, that I have. The idea that I have is that, in fact, there are two arrows pointing in the same direction, uh, the high head arrow and the heart arrow. And you can, uh, and in fact, this direction points towards the Department of Economics where I teach. Real people, head and heart are all the, um, together in allowing us to, to design and to evaluate 
effective policies uh, to fight poverty. So randomized evaluations, uh, which is what I, I do in most of my research uh, and what some people do in your faculty and what JPAL has been uh, structured to help as many people as possible do, take a scientific approach to tackling poverty. It uh, rests on the idea that the more you know about what works and what doesn't work, the more effective policy will be, but also the more you will learn about the root cause of poverty, and therefore you will be able to um, design more effective uh, policies moving forward. So JPL uh, uh, was founded at the MIT Economics Department in 2003. We now have a very large affiliate networks, uh, more than 500 affiliated and invited researchers across uh, universities in the entire world. Uh, and we do three things. We conduct uh, randomized evaluations. We do policy outreach to share the result of this evaluation, but also to inform what the evaluation should even be about. You can see arrows in both directions. And we do capacity building, both of policymakers, of students, of activists, of NGO workers, to uh, spread the idea of, uh, of, of rigorous evaluation of programs and to make sure this is, these are done well. And all of these things uh, kind of rest on each other very importantly. So in order to kind of to get started on the concrete example of what is a randomized evaluation and why they're important, let's take a real challenge in a real setting where the stakes are really high. Um, and this is immunization. So worldwide, 2.5 kids uh, die every year from vaccine preventable diseases, according to the WHO. This is before COVID. So this, this uh, include the, 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 the immunization that are a part of the extended package of immunization, for example, measles. Um, India uh, is one of the lowest uh, countries with the lowest immunization in the world and one of the five countries that uh, account for the vast for the majority uh, of the 25 million of children who every year uh, go without immunization. Uh, for example, only according to uh, the NFHS, only 44% of children uh, of one year old are fully vaccinated and that's probably uh, an overestimate anyways. Uh, in, in India, in Rajasthan, uh, one of the states in India, that's actually not very far from, from you guys, 27% um, of the one-year-old are fully vaccinated. But 95% receive the first vaccine. So the problem of immunization is not one, of childhood immunization is very different from the problem of, so for example, COVID vaccines that, are, that has been experienced in some of the uh, Western world where people don't want it. With immunization, people actually are open to it. Most of people in service said they would love to get their kids immunized, but they just don't get around to do it. So why is it that there is this very easy tool to, to combat uh, childhood mortality? Um, and it's not, uh, people are in general, parents are in general willing to do it, but they, they don't get around to do it. The first problem uh, is a problem of supply. This is a sub in, uh, in in Rajasthan, in the district of Udaipur, uh, where we conducted uh, 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 research on immunization several years ago now, and that subcenter was closed, and it was closed actually most of the time. Uh, in uh, nationwide, on any given day, 40% of uh, uh, subcenters are closed. Uh, this is also what we found in in the Udaipur district. Uh, the other problem is that. Uh, uh, people uh, don't get around to get their kids immunized. Again, there is a lack of demand that doesn't stand for, doesn't stem from a huge resistance, but just stem from the fact that people have a lot of other things on their mind. Uh, they, they are always busy uh, doing things, you know, making food on the table, taking care of other kids. And immunization is something that can always wait because it, it's not an answer to an urgent problem. Uh, you you can always wait till the next month, and therefore it tends to be uh, to always uh, postponed. So maybe it's a little bit too far. Maybe you have other things to do. Maybe uh, uh, there are side effects or it's painful. And the benefits are hard to see because they are sometime in the future, and also they don't cure something. They prevent something from happening. So people have difficulty creating the the, the counterfactual. So what are the solutions? So most of the policy effort uh, in Pakistan, uh, India, and elsewhere, actually around the world, 
has been to, to try and ensure reliable supply. And in fact, when we started this research and we had a consultation with various NGOs about this, this problem, um, in New Depot District, where ammunition was particularly low, the, the, the NGO really put the blame on the government effort that were insufficient. So what we tried to test first here in this work is, suppose you ensured completely reliable supply at people's doorstep, which is really what uh, in the best world possible would happen as a result of current government effort. So you set up mobile vaccination, well monitored, you make sure, make sure the camps are happening on a very regular basis, and you inform people that those camps would happen, which is done via frontline health workers. But as we were doing the, that, uh, uh, we had a suspicion that perhaps it would not be sufficient, and that perhaps once the camp is there, the effectiveness of the camp could actually be increased if the demand for ammunition was, was, was increased. And we proposed, and the NGO kind of, we worked with, called Seva Mandir, uh, Humordus, in a sense, to say, let's give a kilo of lentil for each uh, vaccination, plus a tally uh, set upon full immunization. This meant to not you know, convince someone who was not about to get their kids immunized, but to make the occasion memorable and to give a reason to people to come today, because at least there will be some lentils, uh, as opposed to, to wait. In order to look at the effectiveness of this program, uh, we worked in Udaipo district, where at the baseline studies, only 3% of the kids were fully immunized by 18 months. Uh, we worked in uh, about 124, um, 34, sorry, um, hamlets uh, around the depot district. You can see them on the map. And we randomly selected um, 60 hamlets to, in, to really improve the supply in collaboration with the government, where basically Seva Mandir was deputed to be the ones conducting the camps, and they do that with uh, a lot of regularity. And in 30 of those 60, in addition, we added a small incentive. 74 of the hamlets uh, remain control hamlets. You can see them here in, in, in white arrows. Um, and you can see, of course, because this was randomized, that the hamlets are all distributed everywhere. And then we collected uh, data. Uh, what we find is that in the control hamlet, by the end line, full immunization had increased to, to 5% uh, due to the other government effort to solve this problem. But, you know, we are not there. We need to be. In a hamlet where the immunization camps were structured, it moved to 17%, which is already better. But when you added the incentive, it added to it, it, it jumped up to 36% of kids immunized. So because the, 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 the hamlets were randomly selected, we know that in the absence of the intervention, the immunization rates in those places would have been similar. And therefore, we can confidently um, uh, assess that this is these differences between the control and the camp hamlets and between the camp hamlets and incentive hamlets are really due to the incentives. That means that uh, this program is, uh, is, is working, which it was working on a, on a small scale. And the question after that has been, OK, how do we you know, go to the next step? Uh, how do you go from a, this kind of well-designed, well-run, well-implemented intervention where everything went pretty much according to plan to actually changing the world to evidence. And this is what I want to talk about uh, for most of the day. So first of all, uh, uh, starting in a sense by the end of the story, uh, Japan's experience uh, has been that it is possible. So Japan was created with the um, with the explicit mission, uh, which was at the time perhaps not very common in, uh, in the policy, um, in the research world, to uh, uh, ensure that a maximum number of people uh, would be touched by policies which have been uh, proven to, to, to be effective. So one of the things we track uh, in our work is how many people can we say have been touched by policies that have been evaluated by an affiliate in our network. Uh, so when we started in 2003, that was very few. Uh, 2008 was uh, already 23 million. 
2019 was 400 million. And during the COVID period, uh, it grew a lot because we did a lot of work on COVID related things. So we now uh, um, at about uh, 650 uh, million lives. Uh, this is, of course, only the people who are directly affected. So it doesn't count uh, a number of people who might be loosely affected, say, by a change in regulatory environment or things like that. This is sort of the direct channel that, for example, if we evaluated the immunization incentive policy, how many people got touched by immunization incentive program down the line. Uh, this happened uh, pretty much uh, everywhere uh, in, uh, across uh, all uh, continents. And how did it happen? So, how does how do you go from uh, from policy to uh, to um, policy impact, in particular at this scale, in the hundreds of millions, or you know, trying to reach a billion uh, uh, very soon? The straw man is that you run a small, well-controlled experiment like the one I showed you in Udaipur. Then you get the results, you analyze them. Then you prepare a, a report that you try and uh, get published somewhere in a good journal. So in this case, we published in the British Medical Journal. And then you prepare a shiny policy brief uh, that you then peddle to policymakers. Uh, and then uh, up, uh, lo and behold, there is full scale adoption and that's it. So that's kind of uh, the, the, the straw man of how policy, how you go from policy to to. Uh, from research to impact. And at some level, when I started JPAL, or uh, when we started JPAL in 2003, or when I started the work of doing randomized evaluation, I perhaps uh, somewhat believed in that Stroman to, to some extent. But in fact, it's not really, so in that Stroman has been subject to all sorts of critics by critics of randomized evaluation. So oh, the, the, it is small experiments are too small, and in addition they are gold plated, so you can ensure that several they will run well the camp, but no one else could run them as well, or the incentive would be stolen on a larger scale. This is this doesn't really make sense. Uh, the results might not be valid. They might, and if they are valid, in, they might not be internally valid because there are always problems in experiments. Not everybody takes up. There could be spillover. There could be other kind of difficulty of evaluating, which means that your your uh, your uh, actual analysis always comes with some uh, caveats that are not, uh, you know, that and you kind of away from the simplest gold standard of of a clinical trial. And then even if you get valid results, maybe they will not replicate elsewhere. Then when you prepare your policy brief and you try to sell it to policymakers, even if you manage to, to get results that you believe in and are externally valid, maybe no one is interested at this point and no one will, will, will adopt that thing. Uh, so uh, your research that comes from whatever your research priority is, might not fit at all with the priority of the country and therefore you've kind of not really get adopted. If you get lucky and you still uh, uh, get interest and it gets adopted, then the results could be very different if adopted at scale. Even if your study was well done, even if they were internally and externally valid, the moment it's done at scale, you get equilibrium effect, which is, you know, the, the general equilibrium impact might be different from the partial equilibrium impact. For example, if you have a uh, uh, microfinance, it might affect positively some people at small scale, but would not at large scales. You'd have political economy effects uh, and the like. So these are the type of criticism that we've been getting ever since we started doing randomized experiment. And if this was the way in which get policy impact, then all of this criticism would be valid. But the problem is that it completely misses the way that policy influence actually works. And you don't at all go from this small experiment to full-scale adoption in one go. Uh, the way it works, first of all, is that uh, you need to do a lot of work uh, uh, on the internal and external validity of results. And when we try to get, uh, before we try to, to kind of influence the world, we, try, we make sure that this is in fact uh, the case. So I'll illustrate that with the example of microcredit. So microcredit at some point was uh, all the rage. Um, uh, in, uh, in the 2000s, uh, there was the idea that uh, this was going to, to, um, to change the world. Uh, 
in 2006, uh, uh, Mohamed Yunus uh, won the Nobel Prize for his work uh, in Pakistan. Microcredit was a big part of the strategies. In fact, one of the studies I'm going through is from Pakistan. Um, and there was really nothing else. Then the tone started to shift. Uh, uh, people, uh, sto some stories came up about how high the interest rate uh, was. Uh, interest rates was. There started to be some policy pushback. Um, and uh, uh, the discussions about the limit of microcredit, and then it really shifted to uh, highlighting the, the potential, the suicide due to over and uh, uh in India there was a huge pushback against uh, microcredit, and um, uh, that led to a, to, to a massive uh, a default wave in, in Andhra Pradesh, following by uh, basically an in, uh, heavy regulation of the microcredit agency and the whole industry really kind of took a back seat. What is interesting is that none of this <laughs> uh, discussion was on neither on the positive side nor on the negative, negative side uh, benefited from having any evidence of what impacts uh, were. Uh, the first evaluation conducted were already uh, um, um, uh, were only out in the towards the end of the 2000s. In the Philippines, there was kind of decent results with some moderate effects. In India, uh, we found a very weak effect uh, in a study that we we ran in Hyderabad. That was the first large-scale randomized controlled trial. Uh, but India may perhaps was very, when we got these results, we, we, gave very, we were very careful to, um, to discuss them in public. We really didn't go to town with them because India is very unique context. It's the hotbed of microfinance. The study was in Andhra Pradesh, which is the hotbed of the hotbed of microfinance. And it was in Hyderabad, which is a, a big city where uh, we had a partner who was running a, a micro finance program, but there was also a lot of other options for financial access to even poor people, either through other microfinance or through banks. So we felt like we didn't have much to sell that was of general interest to uh, the microfinance world at large. And so we just waited and we sat on this result. And until seven studies came out uh, from various teams and I was able to assemble them in one volume of one journal, uh, we didn't do anything. So what, then what this, when the studies were kind of individually coming out, we pub published them together in one journal with the same outcomes. Uh, so you can now say something about uh, uh, how results differ from place to place and whether we tend to find the same answers. And um, Rachel Meager, who is uh, uh, now an assistant professor at the LSE and a um, statistician and economist, started to look at this evidence and to combine the various uh, randomized studies into an overall study and also to see how much each study can be informed from the results of the others. So this is what we get for, uh, uh, for the impact of microcredit on business profit. Uh, the blue bars are the simple comparison between treatment and control. And the red bars are the uh, comparison, are, are the, the same comparison between treatment and control, but taking into account the fact that there are also all these other studies and what happened into the rest of the world is to some extent informative about what's happening in each country. And what you find, regardless of whether you find, and then the, the, the bar outside are the, the, the confidence interval. And what you find, regardless of what you look at, is that uh, microcredit is simply not very effective on pro and doesn't, seem, doesn't increase profits really very much anywhere, except in this Philippine that was the original optimistic study, which was probably over optimistic. We then can combine the results from all of these places and look at the effect across a range of outcomes, uh, consumption, expenditure profit, business expenditure, business profit, revenue, and, and, and uh, spending on the temptation goods. And generally, we don't find much of anything. So now, when we have studies in these six countries, we can really be much more confident. The countries are in very different environment 
Some are in Africa, some are in Europe, some are in Asia, some are, some are, uh, um, some are in uh, middle income countries, some are very poor countries, some are rural, some are urban. So we can say a lot about what it does. There is, and the, 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 we can say the extent to which all the results want to pull together towards a common value, and that common value happens to be zero. So in that case, we can really change the result because, in a way, uh, what we say is that, well, this is neither perfect nor terrible. <laughs> uh, like, as the economist uh, reviewed this study, is like a partial marvel. Uh, the microfinance, uh, uh, small, basically, even though the results are subtle, because uh, when you have zero results in a context where people think this is horrible or terrible or, or wonderful, um, it takes uh, a little bit more difficulty for the media to use it, but they were able to, to convey this, uh, this subtlety. And then this changes the debate, uh, and this did change the debate among microfinance enterprises about, you know, how do we make the product, the microcredit product, more effective? Uh, what was the problem? Acknowledging that there was a problem. Uh, and then moving away from... Uh, the problem to, to finding solutions and perhaps a uh, better way to structure the, 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 the financial products or perhaps other financial products that the, that the, the firms can, that people can, might need. So this is what now is, is, is going on with a lot of, uh, of companies. This has been going on for some time and, um, and, and we understand a little bit better uh, what else could be done? Uh, transaction savings, insurance, and ultra poor programs, uh, which are uh, asset transfers, which are not loans. Uh, one of which was evaluated in, in uh, evaluated in Pakistan. So that's my first example, which is we don't even attempt to have policy impact until we have evidence that we are quite confident applies not just in one context but across the board. The second point I want to make is that. Uh, the the uh, the process of scaling up involves uh, a number of difficulties, uh, which make it different from a, a single experiment. So once you have something that you think you do you do think works, once you've replicated in places and keeps working in all these places, then um, you still have the issues of what happens when you move to scale. Uh, can the, uh, how do you ensure faithfulness to the implementation model? And the best there is to have evaluation at scales. And we've been able to do that uh, with, with government. So what's the problem here? Uh, this data from India, but it's really very, there are similar data from Pakistan with similar results. This is even pre-COVID, actually this only goes, this continues uh, down the line. Uh, a lot of kids go to school and many of them don't learn very much. So in standard five, uh, less than half of the children can, can read at standard two level. Of course, COVID made this even worse. So it, there is a huge drop in learning. So this becomes even more relevant. So what's the problem in, in normal time? Uh, everybody has a different theory. Uh, teachers can't teach, children, can, um, uh, um, children cannot learn, etc. Uh, we've done a lot of research on all of these things, all from randomized control trial, which I'm going to uh, uh, spare you. But the bottom line is that none of these things is sufficient. Increasing inputs is not sufficient. Children are able to learn uh, uh, um, if you put them in the right conditions. Teachers are willing to do better, etc. So what is the problem in that case? Well, what we came to kind of... Um, realize is that the biggest problem is that the teachers are trying to teach children who are not really in their classroom. The teachers are bound uh, in most developing countries, in particular the ones that are former colonies, by an extraordinarily hard curriculum that nobody is able to really follow. So if, you, uh, if the teacher addresses himself to the two or three uh, uh, students with the most advanced background in the class and no one else, then, of course, that doesn't uh, uh, help to, uh, to have more teachers or more input or more blackboard or anything. What does help is this model that has been originally developed by Pratam of teaching at the right level, where you start by assessing the kids uh, uh, using simple tools. You group them by uh, homogeneous learning level, and you then focus on the skills that this particular group needs. And then you frequently reassess and move through the levels 
as they progress. And when you do that, uh, we, uh, what happens? So I, I know what happens because we've been evaluating, we've been working with Pratam for now 15 years. First at small level, uh, uh, in Bombay and Baroda, this was actually my first randomized evaluation I was involved with. Then at a slightly larger level in uh, Anuta Pradesh, then in, uh, um, in Bihar, in summer camps, and then uh, we, all of this evaluation showed very good results of the programs. And then there was an effort to, to scale it up uh, by training teachers to implement it. Uh, there was a, um, a, a movement to do this in, in, in Ghana as well. Um, then uh, the, mo the government model was changed for reasons that I'm going to explain in a minute. And finally, uh, uh, another model was try of learning camps uh, run by volunteers in schools. And uh, uh, what did we find there? Well, all of the early evaluations uh, showed very good results uh, of the program until 2008, on the basis of which uh, there was an effort to scale up across many places, including Bihar. When a uh, scale-up was organized in Bihar and Uttarakhand, it was possible to carve out one district out of the general scale-up to have an experiment. So we have the unusual experiment where instead of everybody's in status quo and then a, a small group of people get the treatment, we have everybody gets the treatment and a small group of people get the status quo. So the value of this is that you can really see whether when the program is at scale, it is still works better than doing nothing different. And the result of this experiment, 2008-2010 in Bihar and Uttarakhand, were very disappointing. It didn't work at all. So there we could have said, oh, that's sad. Actually, that model doesn't work at scale. But what we had done is to do some qualitative evaluation and interviews to try and figure out you know, what was happening in the program. And what we found out is that the teachers actually did not implement the program after being tested. And in interviews, what came across is that, oh, I really like your program, it's very nice, but I don't have time to run it because I have to complete the curriculum. And that keeps me too busy. So then we realized that, number one, we need to create that space by having a devoted time, uh, either in the year with the learning camp model or in the day, uh, an hour a day that's devoted to that. And secondly, there need to be a relay by the hierarchy to kind of keep coaxing the teachers, reinforcing them and signaling to them that this is not like an optional activity if they have time. This is actually the nature of their jobs. And so we did that. Uh, we changed the model uh, in, in, in later on and we evaluated that new model in 2012-2013 as well as 2013-2014, both a learning camp model intense campaigns uh, in Uttar Pradesh and a teacher-led model one hour a day uh, with, govern with mentoring by government academic official in Haryana. And both of these models were effective. So now after that, after 15 years of experimentation, we have a model we are ultimately confident in. And therefore there is a scale up that is now happening. Uh, there are millions of kids involved in India and Pratam is now sharing the model across countries in Africa, uh, in, through a teaching at the right level kind of organization uh, that's effective there. Another thing that is kind of completely forgotten by this idea of like you have a new program and then maybe the government doesn't care. You remember I said, you know, maybe the government is not ready. And in fact, for immunization, for example, it took me many years to get anybody be to be interested in immunization demand. But many of the of what we do is actually not so much to uh, make new proposals to government of new things they should do. And it's much more often working with them to improve what they already do, improving programs that run at scale. Uh, so this is what I've called a uh, plumbing, which is that it's not about the big, you know, the shape of the house, of the architecture. It's about the leaks that make the programs that you want to run anyways uh, ineffective. And in my experience, there is a ton of demand in, uh, from governments to address those plumbing problems. I give you an example from Indonesia, where uh, Ben Olken and Abhijit Banerjee and Rima have worked together 
to evaluate at the, at the request of the government to uh, um, improve the, the functioning of an existing program, which is a direct rice distribution program. So uh, one of the cornerstone of their uh, household support program is called the Raskin program, which is a distribution program. And this, this program is in, uh, funded centrally, but implemented locally, and it is rife with corruption. A lot of people do not get the, 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 the rations they should get, and the people who uh, do get it don't get uh, enough, uh, an, uh, enough rice, and they pay too much for it, etc. So the government had the idea that part of the problem was that people were not eligible, were not aware that they were eligible to the program, and they also were not quite aware of what they were eligible for. So they decided to distribute them cards. And the researchers came up and said, great, uh, we can try that. Let's evaluate it. Uh, let's do it in some places first. And in addition, uh, let's um, see whether a particular design of the cards would work better than another one. So at the baseline, the poor received only 30% of the intended subsidy, and they paid 25% more for rice that they should get. Here is an example of, of, of the card, and here is the experimental design that was uh, chosen. So first of all, there were some controlled villages, so people did not, uh, some, in some villages the card were not uh, uh, introduced. And then among the treatment villages, uh, they varied four aspects of the card. First, the information on the card, uh, you know, whether you have, for example, a price uh, in here or not on this one. Second, who gets the card? Uh, do you need to distribute it to every single person or is it enough to distribute to some people? Third, whether there is common knowledge that the card has been given, so a lot of posters in the village, so that the government officials know, that everybody knows, that they know that the card is there, and so uh, it creates a different uh, postures for bargaining. And second, uh, I, uh, introducing some clip and coupons to create an impression of accountability related to the card. When they did that, what they found is that uh, poor families on average across all of the variants of the program got a 26% increase in the subsidy received, driven by reduction in, in, in leakage to, to officials, not to uh, mis-targeting by, by ineligible households. And it's very, very effective. Distributing card is not very expensive. So to get $8 more in subsidies to the poor, the government pays only $1. Uh, they also found out that the, the, the most effective uh, variant of the program, which is to uh, in, 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 give it to everyone, include the price information, and include the posters. Uh, the accountability piece then uh, wasn't so important. Uh, because this was done at the government demand, there was a very quick action on it. The government rolled out the social protection card in 2013 uh, to almost 16 million uh, poor families, reaching 66 million people. And this is part of one uh, broader partnership uh, to improve social deliveries with planned evaluations on uh, newly reformed social benefit schemes, for example, to be improved, uh, uh, implemented by an electronic voucher. So it's a very lightly conditional cash transfer, uh, a little similar to, to what you have. Here is another ex example of plumbing where uh, it is not about the last, last mile delivery. So think of it about the, the faucets being leaking, but it's about the big pipes. And in this instance, it's about the big pipes of uh, of government fine, uh, of uh, um, government kind of uh, monitoring. So uh, uh, India is has an industrial or part of India heavily industrialized. Uh, Gujarat is the most the fastest growing industrial state in India. I guess I, all of the, my my studies that I show to you are in neighboring states to to Rajasthan. Um, the third party to to Pakistan. The, the, and, and there is a huge pollution uh, problem in Gujarat. Uh, this is some of the most uh, polluted uh, places on earth are some of the industrial estates in Gujarat. So, uh, a few years ago, the, the court uh, um, ordered the government uh, to, the Supreme Court of Gujarat ordered the government 
uh, to institute a third party audit scheme because they concluded that uh, uh, they were the, the government was sued by uh, uh, an environmental protection NGO which argued that people um, that the uh, the government was ineffective at monitoring the the, the farms so they said you now you have to include a third third party uh, uh, farms and the way it works is that any company that is in uh, high uh, polluting potential, for example, dyes or uh, textile, etc., chemi chemical, must hire a third party auditor uh, who visits the, the firm uh, a few uh, times a year, uh, collects samples, produces a report and shares that with the government. Now, the problem with this uh, system uh, is what should be it should have been apparent from the beginning, but I guess wasn't. Uh, which is that the, the auditors are hired by the firm and they are and paid by the firm and retained by the firm. So the loyalty of the auditor is really to the firm. And therefore, they tend to, you know, there would be a risk that they would give them exactly what they want. And in fact, this is uh, what we find at baseline. So this is uh, the report from the auditors for uh, one particular uh, uh, pollutant, which is uh, suspended particular matters or SPM. And you can see that 73% uh, uh, of the firms have SPM just below the threshold that is allowed by the law. So either the firms are doing very well or someone is lying. And unfortunately, it's the latter because when we compare that to back checks, which we performed uh, um, a few days later, we find that actually pollution is all over the place. Some farms are less polluting than they claim. Some farms are much more polluting than they plate. And the mass just below the threshold is now a 19% instead of 73%. So we uh, worked with the government to amend the scheme while staying consistent with the constitutional order to fix it and in, uh, to remove the conflict of interest. So we hired the auditors uh, uh, to, to a central pool, not to any individual firm. We uh, had random assignment of auditors and, and fixed payment from a central pool, back checked the auditor for accuracy and the payment or the continuation of the scheme based upon accuracy. So the idea was based on a combination of simple economics and a solid understanding of the institutions uh, we had a very close relationship with the Goodrich Pollution Control Board that made this possible. And the impact is, is, is as follows. So this is the same data on top uh, from the control group. You can see uh, um, so, um, uh, at the uh, midline, you can see a 39% uh, from, the, uh, from the auditor, a 39% uh, uh, effect. And in the control, uh, sorry, this is not the same data. It's now from the treatment group. You remember it was a uh, 76% uh, excess mass. We now go back to 39% uh, uh, of excess mass. So getting rid of most of the excess mass, which shows that uh, the data was much more accurate uh, after the reform. Uh, so more generally, the, the, the way that policy uh, impact works is by fostering a culture of learning inside governments. Uh, Many governments have launched long-run partnership with, uh, with GPAL or other uh, uh, friends in our ecosystem, such as the Mini du Lab in, in, Paru, in Peru or the research partnership we have with Tamil Nadu. Um, the World Bank is now supporting uh, hundreds of RCT and training with governments. Uh, many governments now want us to run an RCT. They are more interested in running their own RCT uh, rather than listen to any evidence we might bring, which is good. Uh, so maybe one day we can make ourselves irrelevant because all this work will happen anyways, uh, independent from us. Uh, so let me stop here in order to, to open for questions and, and, and get your, your sense and feedback. Thank you so much, Professor Duflo. This was a very fascinating talk. Um, kind of refocused our attention on what we need to do to connect policy to research. So what we will do is we will break our questions into two sets, one on the social experimentation approach and the other, the second one on the poverty reduction policy. Um, and I'll start with something you touched on right at the end of the talk um, and tie it to the approach you take in which you take a big problem and break it into a smaller manageable issues to tackle. 
and my question basically is, how do we create an appetite amongst policymakers for programs that target issues that are not big ticket issues? Um, this is particularly given the social political environment in many developing countries where policymakers often wa want quick working silver bullets. So your thoughts on that, please. Uh, so yes, it's hard to, to kind of go with the message that there are no silver bullets and that it will always be, but you know, as Abhijit uh, Banerjee points it, it's always not sil no silver bullet, just silver pellets. Um, uh, so a, a, a range of things. Uh, on the other hand, there is also, I think, uh, um, um, a drive uh, towards, uh, in, in that I see in many countries around the world today, towards uh, um, policies that are uh, somehow are direct benefits of some kind, uh, have direct benefits to the poor. So the cash transfer program is one uh, version of that. <laughs> and this is all often what goes under the term of direct benefit transfers. Uh, but uh, uh, even within the cash transfer program, there are many, many kinds of cash transfer programs directed to various people to achieve various different things. And then the general idea of uh, improving service delivery is sort of, uh, I see in many uh, uh, places where I work, uh, part of uh, sort of populism 2.0, uh, which is uh, um, the understanding that uh, people are fed up of the idea that uh, eventually uh, things will trickle down and, and want to get, want to see something now. And there, when you, in that kind of context, uh, it's actually, I find it relatively easy to say, well, if, if this is what you're, you know, with this generation of politicians to say, well, if, if you're going to go straight to the people with individual level benefits, then you, you know, either in kind or in cash, then, uh, then you might as well uh, try and, 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 and spend that money as effectively as possible and people will reward you for you, for it uh, politically. Where, for example, having good school, uh, uh, I think, uh, doesn't be, uh, is not anymore something that you will uh, give to people out of the goodness of your heart, but something that people will demand and otherwise punish you for it. Uh, so I think I'm seeing uh, some of that happening in, in a lot of our partner countries, slowly, slowly. <laughs> from, um, and that's, uh, uh, that's actually fertile ground to... To, to become interested in this, um, for politicians to be interested in delivering on, on a few things. Uh, and then you don't need to have the general debate anymore in the sense that it can be set aside and to say, okay, there's these few things you're going to do anyway, so let's get the maximum bank for your bucks. So, uh, uh, Esther, I just wanted to follow up on that question by Farah and really, you know, sort of start with your last slide about working with government. Um, and particularly, you know, in your experience, um, I wanted to just get your sense of uh, two challenges that I've seen. One is that the time horizon of policymakers, particularly in countries which are either unstable or which are in democratic processes, so you have changes of government um, can often be much shorter than the kind of learning system requirements. Um, and I just kind of wanted to get your sense of how you manage that. Um, and the second, which is kind of related to that in some sense is that the procurement rules um, of governments in some sense um, are quite antithetical to experimentation, right? Because you have to kind of fix the program, the design has to be fixed. Um, so, you know, how do these two constraints affect um, the move towards creating these learning systems that you've been talking about, which, um, you know, you very clearly established the value for? So on the, the second option, the second uh, question, I think through this uh, kind of the, um, uh, in, in most of my career until relatively recently, I solved that problem by avoiding things that just couldn't get done. 
and, and not worry about it. Just not, not, you know, saying there are so many questions you could ask. There are so many things one could do. If there are some that happens to be impractical because you have uh, some procurement rule that stands in the way, then so be it. We'll do something else some other time. Uh, so that's the, uh, uh, but in the last uh, 10 years or so, I, I've, I've become more, uh, I have a more concrete answer to that, which is, uh, it's often possible, at least it has been my experience in several countries, to, to create learning labs uh, within governments or learning partnership, in which suddenly everything becomes possible as part of, of pilot. And my own experience is more in, in, in India, uh, which is just as bureaucratic as Pakistan, as far as I know, and where actually once you set up this up in this context, a lot of things become possible. But uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the work of Ben Olken and uh, Asim uh, Kwadja and uh, and uh, uh, and everyone else, <laughs> including maybe the people in this audience, uh, on uh, on tax collectors. Yeah. And what they were able to do, what was able, which is to to basically randomize incentives of government civil servants. I, I didn't, I don't think you could get it done in India. I was pretty impressed. Uh, so, uh, so it suggests that there are spaces uh, that can be used if you are uh, doing this in partnership with the idea that you are willing to learn, etc. Now, your first question is essential, and we keep uh, hitting it, uh, even in 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 in, uh, in in settings like, for example, in Tamil Nadu, where we have an excellent partnership. We're working together. They're paying for the evaluation. They're helping us, but eventually they're like, okay. You know, several years years later, what it is that I've learned exactly, and uh, uh, in fact, our policy teams find it uh, a problem because eventually they, they need to un, you know they need to be able to show for what they've done because they've stuck their neck out to work with us. Uh, and my answer to that is that the research process has to adjust uh, to this timing. Uh, to be able to provide answers that are immediately applicable in a, in a you know politician time frame or, or in a policy time frame, it's not a, a, a which is fair enough. You know, you, they, they can't be doing policies for the next. Uh, so the guy who is coming in ten years, they have to do policy now. But often it is so that puts some constraint on the research program. You can't just estimate something, wait twenty years, and come back. But uh, it is often possible. Uh, where you will have, uh, um, for example, just showing results on your baseline study and the finding from that, the descriptive finding from that, we're finding our partners very happy <laughs> to learn these things because often it's things that, you know, they haven't been used to look at it in this way and suddenly they're learning these new things. So, for example, in Tamil Nadu, we... Uh, we did, we, we've done a lot of work on pension, and I knew it was going to take some time, but we first started with a big base of census of all people and where they live. And our first result, which we got from that very census, is that 18% uh, of elderly people live entirely alone. And we shared that result, and no one knew. This was, and this is, this was really important to them to, to find that out. Because that completely changes your policy framework if you think every single old person is in an extended family versus more than one in six is, uh, is entirely alone. That changes the way you want to think about delivering care, about uh, uh, pensions and all that. Same with this same project. Uh, um, the, uh, the, the DES, so the, the one arm of the government, conducted the baseline survey actually. We were just okay, kind of guiding the process. And they identified a bunch of people who, on the basis of observable characteristics, looks like they should be eligible for the pension, but we are not getting it. Then they gave this list to the finance department and tell them, go and, you know, give them the pension. So as if they applied for them. And then the finance department people went and they examined their case and they, they, they knocked off almost everyone. And that again was complete news to the to the IS who were in charge of them. That why are we kicking so many people? And you know th this is this seems like inconsistent with the idea that it should be available to the poor. We provided them with the statistics, which is that people who don't get the pension are poorer. Who people who get the pension? This is like the poverty pension. 
And they could also see where the problem was. There was uh, someone at some point added the rule that you needed to be destitute to get the pension, destitute not being defined anywhere, allows for flexibility and who gets it. And so now, like we, with that, they identify the problem. They can try and solve it. They haven't solved it yet. Uh, uh, because that's actually more complicated than it than it seems to <laughs> to, uh, to 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 clarify the, their problem, but they know that it is that, and they were able to they, they wrote down a, a sort of a, a framework policy for old age, where one of the primary objective is to make pension old age pension allocation transparent and and clearer, and you know, and this was things we were able to tell them within six months of having started working with them that is policy actionable. Now, then finally we were able to convince them to give some pension, uh, which is still remarkably only to half of the sample we gave them, but we are getting there. And now we just completed a second wave of the panel, and so within a few weeks we'll be able to give them the impact, the final impact. Meantime, during the COVID period, we collect, we, we phoned everyone and we had a phone survey for how are people with and without pension fearing during COVID. So in the middle of COVID, we could tell them people with pension are doing so much better in terms of mental health, in terms of uh, uh, food security, in terms of, uh, and this was like a five minute survey on the phone. The full results, the one that we are going to publish, or, or you know, maybe if we manage to publish, will be after you know the second wave, which has taken a few years. But in the meantime, we were there, kind of sharing results at every step. Many of them not based on the RCT, but sort of uh, 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 nevertheless useful. So that uh, uh, you know, I think, it really has to become standard operating procedure, and it's not very. And it's not an instinct for the for the researchers to make themselves useful, uh, but I think it's key to making this type of partnership work because there the the insistence on you need to tell me something that I can go on now is completely legitimate. Uh, you cannot just tell them why well, uh, it should be sufficient to to want to contribute to science. So the two things can be combined. Sorry, that was a long answer, but I, I felt okay. giving you a kind of specific example would make that uh, clear. Sure, um, and I think just looking at the time, I'm, I may switch gears a bit and go uh, a bit more specific into the policy reduction uh, questions as well. So, you know, I was struck when you were discussing the vaccination rates on on priors about product take up and, and how they can define policy and and that we often over or underestimate what the take up could be like. So, for example, we often assume that grants and transfers once they are provided will be readily taken up. Um, but we see even if information is not a constraint, then the stake up can be low. Um, and you discuss this in your book. Um, and I'm wondering if you can say a bit more about other constraints that might, may exist. For instance, um, you know, these could be preferences or dignity of, of, for their own work um, or being intimidated by a complex sign up procedure. And what these factors could, what role could these factors play in inhibiting take up of um, social assistance programs? Yes, that's a great question. So, uh, so there is really a great, <laughs> there is really a lot of things that uh, prevent the take up of programs. One of them is the uh, the hoops that people have to join, uh, that have to jump through in order to take it, which opens two things, or three things. One is that they might not just not be able to manage it. So for old people and their pension, for example, that's a problem. You know, all the old people cannot even go to the city to speak to a government official. Uh, so it's just like a physical impossibility to do that. In the Good Economy for Hard Time, we discuss an example for, uh, for a program for an assistance for 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 uh, abandoned women, which are not even old, so that's not the issue. But it's just so difficult for them to to apply. The second is um, because it's difficult uh, to apply. Uh, it can create a discouragement effect. Where so this is actually something that I've heard not from. A, uh, from someone in India, but someone in France, uh, uh, which said basically, if anybody is going to be excluded from this program, it's going to be me. They are going to find a way to to. So people get uh, really despondent and discouraged and think that they are not going to manage, and it's and that's the great uh, value of universality. That you know, it's it is for you because it's for everyone. So there is no. Uh, 
um, and that's why some some organizations that are working with the with the very poor in in including in rich countries like for example uh, ADD uh, First World which works everywhere they work in um, they work in France and they really say that everything has to be universal or at least a universal right in order for people to to think that they are not going to be kicked out for some reason. And the third thing is, of course, as soon as you have complexity and exception, etc., it creates opportunity for rent seeking by the people who are in charge of making decisions uh, and or a misunderstanding of their mission, which is a lot of people, a lot of, for example, in Tamil Nadu, <laughs> I think the people who administer the pension have this view that they are, they are, they are, their job is to save money for the government by excluding anybody who has any chance of not being 120% eligible. Um, so that's another issue. But more generally, I think it's like there is as many reasons for this take-up problem to, to, to exist as there are programs. They, are, they tend to be a little bit program-specific, uh, which is why uh, uh, that's a plumbing issue, which is basically things have to be... Uh, every program has to be... To, to, to try out what might work, and it's not clear that it would work uh, the first time around uh, unless, of course, you go for universal and just give it to them, which is not always feasible or desirable. Uh, anything else that involves some amount of targeting requires tinkering around the edges. Um, because there might be there's some things that seems to work well in some context and, and, and might just uh, not work for a particular program or population. So Esther, uh, a colleague just uh, sent me a, a question, uh, which may be quite useful to bring in now, uh, which is sort of your recent work with Abhijit and others on ultra uh, poor programs. Um, so his question is basically, you know, sort of what, what are the limits of things like unconditional cash transfers um, seen in light of ultra poor programs and what kind of value do ultra poor programs uh, introduce? And in answering that, if you could, because there's a wider audience, if you could also just explain a little bit about what ultra poor programs are. About. Yes, absolutely. So the unconditional cash transfer and ultra poor, I think, are solving different problems. They have different uh, different things they are trying to do, and in a sense, comparing them is not uh, is not fair to either <laughs> programs. Uh, but it's very useful to ask the question in these terms because most people try to compare them and run a horse race, which doesn't make much of a sense, in my opinion. So an unconditional cash transfer is just that, an unconditional cash transfer, which is you get the money. Uh, um, either uh, sometimes there is uh, um, uh, some targeting rule, sometimes not, not even, and uh, you, uh, you just get it straight. And it can be very helpful for people to, when they face a, a hardship, uh, to kind of get over the hardship. The evidence uh, so far, as far as I know, is that they are effective when they exist and then when they stop, they, they don't have any long-term impact. Um, which I don't, I've never seen as a really a drawback of this program. It just is what it is. It's like when you get the money, it helps, and then therefore these are the type of program that you think you should think about uh, needing in perpetuity for a, for a bunch of people, uh, uh, or uh, it, structured in a way that they are financially sustainable for the government. For example, uh, by making it only available to some people, targeting them well, etc. So that's one. The ultra poor program have a very different objective. The ultra poor program, first of all, address themselves to the absolute, absolute poorest in the, in the in the country or in a community. So, for example, in a poor village in Pakistan, in a rural areas, it's only like the three, four, five poorest people who would be uh, eligible for it. Usually, people who have who uh, experienced some massive hardship in their life. For example, a woman who have lost their husband or, or who need to take care of a disabled husband and so on. And who live uh, in the margin of societies, maybe from homes, from local solidarities, from manual work, etc. And for whom a, 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 a small cash transfer would uh, you know, help them to survive, but uh, uh, maybe nothing beyond that. 
the ambition of the of the of the ultra poor programs is actually the, sometimes it, this, those are called graduation programs. This is how Brack, uh, who came up with the program, likes to call it, is that you graduate from the state of ultra poverty to a state where you are now able to kind of get inserted in the community in a productive way. So for that, they, they, they have uh, uh, assumed that the money would not be enough, that what you need to do is to give people uh, a, the, the chance of a productive life. So um, in, in general, it's an asset, a productive asset that is transferred to people of their choosing. It could be some cows, it could be enough to start a micro enterprise, it could be you know, sheep or uh, a sewing machine, something like that. And along with that, significant support uh, for taking care of the enterprise. For example, it's a cow they get vaccinated for taking care of their lives. So literacy program, savings group, etc. that meets every week. Uh, on average, the, 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 the cost of these supplemental services is about uh, doubles the cost of the program and the, of the assets. So it's not like cash transfer where your essential money is just a cash transfer. Here you, you pay twice as much. They do that for 18 months, and after 18 months, the person has graduated. And so the big question for these programs is whether they do... Uh, it, here, the long-term impact are critical, because the big question for this program is whether they do fulfill their promises of having, you know, of pushing people out of this extra, extraordinary poverty in which they are into, you know, normal poverty, where they can then benefit from all the other things that the government is given, or local people are given. And it's now been evaluated in seven countries, uh, including Pakistan. In India, uh, I did a study where we are now, uh, we have a 10-year follow-up. And across countries, very consistently, what you find is, is tremendously positive effect of this program. In the short run, after uh, 15 months, in the medium run, after three years, five years, and uh, 10 years. Uh, after 10 years, the original beneficiary are retired. They are not running their businesses anymore very much, but their children are migrating further. They uh, earn more money from this migration and the consumption is higher, food security is higher, etc. So the promise of, uh, of uh, getting out of this tra poverty trap seems to be fulfilled, uh, which makes them a very different object than the, than the cash transfer. So I wouldn't say, okay, ultra poor wins, but I would say, a, a comprehensive strategy would probably have a combination of uh, a very small cash transfer a, a, a available to anyone who is in a crisis, basically, uh, and uh, a, a, a much larger ultra poor programs available to the to to, to the, the, the poorest of the poor. Uh, that's fascinating because usually, at least we see here, the mix is the opposite. We have very large. Uh, cash transfers and very small uh, graduation programs. Uh, but I just wanted to kind of ask one follow up before I hand it over to Farah. Um, these are bundled programs. Um, and I was wondering if, you know, um, you and others are thinking about doing evaluations of unbundling some of the components. Yeah, that's a very important question. Uh, and and uh, it has been done uh, in Ghana. Yeah. Uh, so there is a study by Dean Carlin, Abhijit Banerjee, and others that unbundles the cash transfer and the extra support. And what they do find is that it's, the extra support is, is, is essential. That without the extra support, what you have after three years is basically people are, have more assets to the extent they got given an asset and then it depreciated to some extent and nothing else. Uh, so uh, I, I wish there was more than one. To my knowledge, there is one. There might be more than one that I'm not aware of, but this one is pretty clear in its uh, in its results. And that's a great question. When you do something bundled, you know who knows. Yeah. So um, I have a question on microfinance. I mean, you do you showed a very good summary of the average effects of microfinance, and that it's not been transformative. Uh, but what does recent evidence suggest about effectiveness of, of uh, you know, new products such as asset financing vis-a-vis -vis recent evidence on asset transfers? So what are some of the few, you know, a few open questions about how we can make microfinance more effective? Uh, so that's a great question. Um, I, I don't have a full 
vision of the microfinance literature today it's uh, it's quite active but let me tell you what i know uh, and it is it's very likely that you know more than me so you can uh, you should complement <laughs> you should complement what i said so first of all one thing we do know is that um, some people benefit even in uh, even of the traditional product and in particular for example in our in our india project in our uh, initially hyderabad project where we really don't find much on average we do find that the group that already had a business before microfinance came to town uh, uh, um, benefit we found that in the first survey and we did a follow-up where it's really obvious that they they have on them on this subgroup uh, they are all uh, uh, their businesses are doing better except their 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 consumption is higher and uh, so there is that subgroup of already entrepreneurial people who seems to benefit from the from the program hence the question of how do you know who is already an entrepreneurial people because you can do that for the first time you introduce microfinance whether they had the business or not but after that microfinance will be there and you cannot check whether they had a business or or not um, so uh, what we uh, did is to so uh, what people are working on now is uh, what's the best way to identify the kind of promising entrepreneurs and there is for example great work by natalia rigol and ben roth that are looking at and reshma hussan that are looking at uh, the ability of people in the village or in the community or in self-help groups to know who is actually an entrepreneur and who would do a good job with with the program so that's an example of uh, very innovative interesting research of better targeting um, uh, um, i haven't seen much very successful effort to to evaluate the impact of something that for example bandan book bank is trying to do which is to graduate some of the microfinance people who have been successful to the bank and give them more money that doesn't mean the program is not effective but the evaluation is complicated because the numbers get very small because not very many people are willing and able to get money so i'm i'm hope to me that's a very open question of whether you can use the success in microfinance to build a track record for people to move to more traditional banking pro program with much larger loans um, Esther, we've got a series of questions for you on, on, on the RCT approach. So our colleague Maha Rahman asks, between the first RCT and scale up, how should one plan for trying the same intervention in different contexts? Um, because her concern is that can become a never ending series of experiments. Besides context, should other factors like difference in implementing partners matter? Uh, what does your experience suggest? Yes, so, so that's that's a very good point, which is eventually uh, when do you stop, and and that's where sort of a, a little bit of theorizing helps us, which is uh, you know you know that if you gave blue textbooks and they didn't work, it's probably not going to be red textbooks that are going to work. Where do you know it from? Well, from you know uh, sort of basic uh, 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 theory of what needs to be tested. Similarly. Uh, so sometimes that can be structured a little bit more. For, so, for example, if you have six uh, evaluation of microfinance and none of them works, then uh, you can actually use statistical method to say what would be the information gained from any further one. <laughs> what is it likely to tell you? And maybe we should stop now. Uh, so I think that's actually an excellent uh, open area of like, when do you stop in terms of how many... Uh, 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 how many evaluations you need to run and uh, to some extent what is the, the variability of the results you got so far tells you about what else you need to know for context dependence. Uh, so if the con intuitively if the context dependence is not very high until now then maybe you don't need to, to continue and if it's very high then you need to continue because you need to to be able to get to a point where you'll be able to explain the feature of the context that are, that are, that are relevant. Uh, this is a, what people do today in a in an adult kind of a way, and we could do uh, much more um, formally down the line. Uh, for variants of the program, it's 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 a little bit the same thing. Uh, 
uh, you have to, you know, take your best foot forward. I have some work about, you know, trying many, many variants of a program in one context, which provides you with like many, many, many uh, potential variability of a treatment. And then how do you, you know, what's the statistic analysis of that? And for the at scale experiment, that can actually be something promising is you're kind of looking at everything that everybody has tried in various settings, throw everything out uh, and then uh, use some statistical uh, method related to, to you know, machine learning to tell you which kind of emerges in, your, in this context where you're going to scale up later as a winner. So that in this way, that allows you to, to combine you know, what has been done by various people, uh, uh, not just the same program in, in different contexts, but uh, variants of the programs that might have appeared to be promising and you want to, to, to test out. Um, so Professor Dufla, we have a question from one of our students who's basically asking about which ideas to test. So he's um, he's asking, how, how are you sure that an experiment which requires large funds and an insurmountable amount of time would work? Oh, but you can't be sure, otherwise you wouldn't run the experiment. Uh, you, you, in, in reality, the working means, uh, or an experiment to work means, was it implemented correctly? Then, if it happens to be a zero, you've learned something. Uh, but presumably, you you always try to put your best foot forward. So you're using the intuition of people in the field, uh, existing research, uh, to not try something that doesn't make any sense. So uh, that's a kind of a combination of common sense and uh, and and prior knowledge. The good thing is that then you're not bound to it and just r running this program for the entire world waiting for uh, 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 and, and, and maybe <laughs> maybe if you did that without the experiment then you would not have a, uh, you would never know that it's not helpful but it is still not helpful so you kind of would pick your program a bit the same way that you would pick it if you were going to scale it which is it's your best foot forward of what might work and then, you know, not everything works, that's for sure. Um, and if I can just add, Esther, it's also that, you know, you look at a lot of programs and there are a lot of ineffective programs on the menu of the public sector. So actually yes. by running experiment, if you can show that some programs are not working, you could actually release effective public money. To exactly, them. exactly. So that's why I'm saying that from the point of view of an experiment, working doesn't mean finding something. Yes, finding exactly. nothing is actually very helpful in microcredit. You know, the series of zero that I showed you were, you know, extraordinarily influential in reallocating uh, capital towards more effective uses. Um, we have one final question from Shruti, which says uh, embedded experiments also blur the distinction between evidence and policy. This is a quote from an article by Jean Drez. She's saying, how can one guard against such a possibility when running experiments in partnerships with government? Uh, so I'm, I'm confused about what he's trying to, to say here. So uh, um, I guess he's saying that there are poor policy choices that the state is making. So the menu is just like poorly chosen then is there a benefit of running uh, experiments in partnership with a government which is running poor policy choices? Uh, well, it, it's the same thing as uh, before, which is <laughs> uh, you're, you're trying to put your, so you, you will presumably try to, best, to put your best foot forward, uh, but if something doesn't work, it's good to know as well. Uh, and uh, uh, the advantage of this uh, 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 sort of embedded uh, sort of plumbing experiment is that the, the stakes are pretty low, actually, because even though you're doing it them on a large scale, you actually, you're usually doing them on dimensions where nobody has a very strong view uh, uh, of what the results should be. Uh, at least nobody at the top. In the, in the example that he discusses in, the, in that article, that Jean-Dres discusses in this article, it turns out that, so which is a reform of the fund flow uh, in the NREGA program, uh, and in particular a reform of who needs to give approval for a project, 
it turns out that people at the lower uh, level had had a stake because the the reform took away the the control from them uh, to to send it at the set of basically to automatize it so in this case someone had a stake but the person who had a stick was not the person who was running the program who was an IAS officer whose only objective was to make this program work uh, uh, better and didn't have a strong view of uh, what would make it work better. So, um, I, so, far, so I tend to stay away from experiments where uh, uh, there is a lot of political interest in, in, in proving that the program works. Yeah. So flagship program. So for example, I never, uh, the, the, the program on which we did this, this particular experiment, this fund flow reform experiment is the MRNJ program, which is a workfare program, was a flagship anti-poverty program of the Congress. I would never have come, gone anywhere near evaluating the program itself because there was too much riding on the, on the effect. You, you, you're kind of much better off going either to things that nobody cares about or doing things where people care a lot about making the program works, but you're not evaluating the program, you're evaluating version A versus version B, and there is genuine ignorance about what might be better. True, you might prefer version D that would work even better, but that's if that's not an option, that's not an option. Which is your kind of microfinance story, right? I mean, that's the spirit in which that relationship went. Uh, in some sense. Yeah, so the, in microfinance, it started by the high stake question. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, this is where we got the most flack. <laughs> we, we got in really in fights uh, over that when all of the studies came about uh, uh, with, uh, you know, some people from the microfinance world really being not happy with us. But then it moved away from that to you know, guys, we're not against microfinance. It's just the way it is working now is not uh, optimal and we can make it work better. And then uh, kind of uh, the experiments restarted with that in mind uh, uh, in a more uh, tinkering process and away from does it work or not work. Farah? Yeah. Um, no, I think those were all the questions. So maybe we can end for the day. Uh, Dr. Chima, would you like to say a few words at the end? Uh, thanks so much, Esther. It's kind of been a real um, sort of fascinating talk about the experimental method. Um, you know, it's something we're also teaching here, but a, a lot of our colleagues are, are invested in it. Uh, so it was great to have you here. And I know you've been very busy, so thanks for taking our time. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, thank you for the invitation. It was a great conversation and uh, I hope to be in touch in the future. Thank you so Bye. much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.